Morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Galatians study. And actually, my my thing here is wrong. We're not in Galatians three nineteen. I think we're in Galatians three twenty four. Is about where we're at uh, today. So we're going to be covering that. Remember that the book of Galatians has to do with the people that were in Paul's first missionary journey that lived around Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. And so, before we get into it, let's go ahead and have ourselves a prayer. So, bow with me if you would. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and glorify you because of who you are, and because of who your Son is and your Holy Spirit. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be here with us as we strive to understand your word. We pray that your Spirit would guide us and lead us as we try to understand your Spirit and therefore interpret your word according to your Spirit and not according to ours, because we understand that the the person who delivers a message for us had a certain spirit when they gave it. And if we try to impose our spirit, Father, we end up with misunderstanding things. So we ask that your spirit would be with us so that we might understand your word and understand you and understand our relationship with you and how much you love us and care for us. And so we pray, Father, that as we study that you would be with us. And we're so thankful for Jesus and the forgiveness of our sins that we have. And Father, we mentioned a number of people that needed prayer today. We pray that you would be with all of them, that you would bless them, and not just with them, but with the world, Father. We pray that you would do things and act in the world in such a way that people might turn towards you and look to you and understand the gravity of life. We pray, Father, that you be with us and bless us as your people. We pray that you help us to glorify you in all that we do and as always, Father, we ask you to forgive us for our shortcomings and our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're looking at Galatians, and like I said, the Galatian letter is dealing with the church that's in Galatians and, and uh, um, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. So remember that the, that the message wasn't written to a particular individual church, but it was written to a local church. I'm sorry, it wasn't written to a local church. It was written to a location where there was different churches that were there, but they're all considered God's churches. If you're in your notes, I want you to notice that in our outline, let me turn it here so people have it in our outline here. In our outline, what we've looked at and what we've been looking at is that the chapter three deals with uh, an explanation and an illustration of how God saves us by faith. So let me ask you guys. What are some of the things that Paul has told us to prove to us that God saves us by faith? What are some of the things that he mentioned in chapter three that we've covered? Okay, the, the law keeps us in custody of, uh, until we get to the faith, okay? Is that it? I spent four weeks and that's all you learned? Okay. All right. So one of the things is we got the spirit by faith and not by works. Okay. Okay. He gave us the, gave us the example of Abraham being saved by faith and we're saved the same way. I'm sorry. Okay. That God made a promise to Abraham and therefore it's not on the basis of law. It's on the basis of promise. And then what did God say about the law itself? Why, why couldn't we be saved by the law? So, so there's a curse on the law. And so we're saved by faith because of the curse of the law. Then he also tells us that the law was added because of transgressions. And it was given to us by a mediator. And so all of those things imply or teach that the law was not the means whereby we are saved. And that's why in our outline you have in chapter three on your outline in your notes, uh, you have the, that Paul illustrates it by the giving of the spirit, he illustrates it by Abraham, he illustrates it by the curse of the law, he illustrates it by the fact that God gave us a promise and, and not a law, and then he told us the purpose for the law, and that's really the section that we're in now is dealing with this purpose of the law, although we're going to get a little past that, and then we're going to notice that, that he's going to be talking to us then not only about the purpose for the law, but he's going to be telling us about what the law is supposed to lead us to so that we can understand that we're saved by faith. So that's, that's kind of where we're at today. 
And if I remember right, because I was trying to look on my notes here and I didn't write it down, but I believe that we got down to Galatians chapter three and down here at about verse 24 is where we're at. So we're at Galatians 3, 24. Yeah, 324. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, 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 I was going to say, too, that drug is an awful up to because we can't keep the law perfectly. So, therefore, we would be pushed by the law. It's also going to show us our need. Sure. For, to, for, the, for the Savior King. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's, that's part of the law, uh, the law idea. So anyway, so we're down here at verse 24. So if you're looking in your notes, that would be on page, uh, those of you that have it out, if you have it out, that'd be on page 79, right? All right, so on page 79 is about where we're at. They would get ready to take a look here as Paul is describing for us or talking for us then about the conclusions to some of these things that he's been talking about because in verse 24, it says, therefore, and whenever you see the word therefore, what are you supposed to do? See what it's there for. And so what he's saying is because of everything he listed above, therefore, he's going to make some applications or he's going to make some conclusions for us so that we can understand how we're saved. So he, he, he tells us that we're all in bondage under sin, that the scriptures uh, pointed out that we're all sinners. We're kept in custody by the law. And, and as a result of that, he says, therefore, the law has become our, tu our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. For, all, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Therefore, it is neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. And so as he, as he begins to, some conclusions here about the law, after telling us that the law was added because of transgressions, it was given to us by the agency of mediators, it was for the purpose of convicting us of sin, and it, was, it held us in custody, and so he says the purpose for all of that was to be a teacher, was to be a guide for us. It was supposed to lead us somewhere. And verse 24 says, therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Uh, if you go to uh, Colossians over here, in Colossians chapter 2, uh, it says, as it's talking about some of the items of the law, uh, he says down here in verse 16 after talking about the fact that jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified and therefore was able to remove sin from us uh, paul concludes in colossians 2 16 therefore no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or to a sabbath day now the sabbath day uh, is of course the day of rest the new moon was a, 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 a sacrifices they were supposed to do at the time of the new moon. Uh, and they had festivals, remember the three main festivals that they had. And so he's pointing out these, these what we would call ceremonial activities of the law. He says uh, food and drink were also ceremonial activities of the law or in respect to festivals or new moons or Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belonged to Christ. So therefore, what he's saying is, is that everything over here on this side was a shadow that was being cast by God over here. So if I could kind of make this really big cross up here, right here, and we put the sun over here, and it makes this shadow over here where you can kind of see the I see it. I know. <laughs> it's a shadow, Katie. Which is the so, so, so you have the sun up here, and you have this giant cross here, and the sun is casting a shadow over here, but it's kind of a, you know, it's a shadow. You can't see everything. So the Old Testament was a shadow. The Old Testament was a, was a slight reflection of what Jesus was going to do. So everything in the Old Testament 
was designed to get us to look at what's casting the shadow. That's what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to teach us. Even from the very beginning in the garden, after they sinned, what did God tell Adam and Eve, especially Eve, in uh, Genesis chapter 315? What did, what did God tell them? You're, you're going to have a seed. He's going to bruise the head of Satan, and Satan's going to bruise his heel. That's his shadow. People are going, what does that mean, right? What, what, what in the world does that mean? You, you don't get the whole story. You just get a piece of it, right? Just like, just like when you see a shadow, maybe if you're around a corner and you see a shadow, you know, because the sun's over here, where you can tell somebody's coming, but you don't know if it's a boy or a girl. You don't know it's a, you know, well, nowadays that's even worse. But you, but, <laughs> but you, you don't know who or what it is until you make it out, until you get to the body. And then when you get to the body, then you understand it. Well, that's what God says the law was. And when he says the law, I don't believe he's just talking about the Ten Commandment law, but he's talking about the five books of law that dealt with the very beginning of creation and played, played a role in helping us understand where we came from and why we're here. And all of that, he says, was a shadow of Christ. So it was a tutor. It was trying to teach us something. It was trying to help us see the animal sacrifices, as I've told you before, without Jesus, the animal sacrifices kind of look like God doesn't like animals. And so he's just going to kill a bunch of animals. I guess God doesn't like sheep and, and oxen and that stuff. Without Jesus, it doesn't make sense. But when you see it's a type of Jesus, then it makes perfect sense. Then you, then you understand why it is that, that uh, God used them. And I'd suggest to you that in Acts chapter 6, where we have the, the church and the apostles are running around teaching and preaching, okay, uh, it says down here in Acts 6 and verse 7, it says, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great number or a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So who were becoming obedient to the faith? The priests. Well, why the priests? Why did the priests be become obedient to the faith in such a great number compared to the rest of the Jewish community? They, they knew the law. They were the ones that, that were killing the, uh, the, the animals. They were the ones that were making sure they were, they were without uh, fault. They were making sure they were male. They were making sure they were the ones that were examining all the laws. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes along and tells them, well, that represents Jesus. And they're going, oh, now it makes perfect sense. And so many of the priests became obedient. So the law was designed to be a tutor in order to bring us to Christ, and the law is still designed to be a tutor to bring us to Christ, because a lot of times when, we, when you study with people, you start with the Old Testament, and you bring them through the stories of the Old Testament, and you bring them through the prophecies of the Old Testament, and the sacrifices of the Old Testament, they come up to Jesus, and then they understand why Jesus then makes perfect sense, and how Jesus ties in with the Old Testament, so the Old Testament is a shadow, and therefore Paul calls it our tutor. It's supposed to teach us something. It's supposed to bring us somewhere, because that's, that's what a tutor does. A tutor brings you from being ignorant to being educated in whatever he's tutoring you in. And that's what's under consideration in Galatians 3.24, when he says, therefore, the law has become our tutor. So is the law good? Yes. But as a tutor, is that... Is a tutor given to you to stay with you your entire life? No. How long is a tutor given to you? Until you get educated, until you, until you learn what it is that the tutor you know, came for. If you have, a, you have an algebra tutor, then they make sure you're going to pass algebra. If you have a, a history tutor, they make sure you're going to pass history, right? Yes, Brother Sandy. Okay. Right. The, and what he's pointing out is that, that there's a curse on every law, because the fact is, no matter what law you have, we don't keep every single one of them all the time, whether it's the moral law or whether it's the law of Christ or whether it's the, it's, you know, yes, civic law or traffic laws. We, we don't keep them all. I mean, you know, if you've been driving your car, like Leroy, like Leroy once said, you know, he was kind of chuckling at a guy who passed him up because he was speeding and then he looked down and he noticed he was speeding. And so, you know, it wasn't intentional, but we don't keep them. So the curse of the law is that you got to do it all. 
if you don't do it all, then you're under the curse of the law, which is you have to pay the consequences. So, yes. Okay. Okay. First of all, I don't know if there were 613 ordinance, well, it, it, ordinances because it doesn't, doesn't say anything. But yeah, they had festivals that they did on the new moon. But was uh, that God's yes. Oh. Yeah. And you can go back. In the old, I can't think of it off the top of my head. But during the, during the new moon, they were supposed to do some certain things. Um, and maybe, maybe Ben can find that, find that for us. But yeah, those, those were, those were um, ceremonial things that they did. Uh, for the purpose of worshiping God. That suggests to you that the reason that they did that during the new moons was because previously when they were idolatrous, they would do stuff at the new moons. You know, that, that's when they would throw their wild parties and stuff. And so God was telling them, if you're going to celebrate the new moon, celebrate him for me, not for the false gods that are out there. And so that's, I think that's why it, it was developed. But, but uh, uh, yes, I, I believe those are in there. Okay, so uh, therefore... At verse 24 says, therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Now, again, the reason that you want the law and you want to find out if you, uh, you know, have something wrong with you is so that you can seek a doctor. It's not just God wants to condemn you and tell you you're sick. God wants you to find help. And the help that we find is so that we may be justified by faith. Now, remember that in the Greek, justified and righteousness are the same word. We have two different words and two different ideas in, in our language, but uh, uh, justified means you're not wrong, and that's what righteousness means. So in the Bible, it's just the word righteous, and that word righteous means being right with God. And so uh, we then can attain righteousness, we can be justified by faith in Christ Jesus, by trusting. That's how, we, that's how God counts us as faithful, just like he counted Abraham faithful when Abraham trusted that God would give him a, a truckload of kids when he didn't have any, and Abraham was willing to trust him. So, so that you may be justified by faith. Now, verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. So once we come to this knowledge we're supposed to come to, once an algebra student passes algebra and gets his algebra certificate, he doesn't need a tutor anymore. Now, he might refer back to the tutor, but he doesn't need a tutor anymore. The, the, he doesn't need a tutor to come and tell him what to do. He now knows what to do. And hopefully he progresses from what he knows what to do. And that's what we need to understand here. So here's what I want you to understand by, by this. There, there was a purpose for the law, no matter what law you lived under, whether it was the law of Adam and Eve, or whether it was the patriarchal law, or whether it was the law of Moses, or whether it was the moral law that the Gentiles lived under, or whether it's the law over here, there's a purpose for that law. And the purpose for that law is to bring you to Christ. That, that's the purpose for the law. And that, that the purpose is not to bring you to another tutor. That's not the purpose for the law. The law isn't to bring you to another tutor. The law is supposed to bring you to what? Well, the, the tutor the tutor is supposed to bring you to what you and I would call maturity. It's supposed to bring you to maturity. That's what you're doing with that tutor. You're trying to teach that person so he get, becomes mature in math or history or whatever. You know, you 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 want you want a mature, educated doctor, not necessarily an old doctor. Uh, you want a mature doctor. You want, you want a doctor that's educated and knows what he's doing. Uh, and so therefore we send him to 12 years of, of tutorship, but after he comes out, he, you know, he doesn't have to go back to his, to his tutoring or to his tutors in order to, to work. He knows what to do, Katie. <laughs> right. Right. Now, old would be okay because we expect old people to be what? Mature. We expect old. <laughs> we, we expect old people to be we expect old people to be mature, 
But have you ever known an old person who isn't mature? Who doesn't who doesn't do right? Don't don't start looking around the room, guys. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So so just being old doesn't make you mature. It just makes you old, right? Mature in, in the scriptures is when you, when you can handle the word of God. Now, usually age helps you because you have more time to be educated. Like, for example, the doctor that's 30 years old, you would think he would have more information than the doctor that just got out of school, right? right? Even though they both have degrees, right. you'd expect the older doctor to know a little bit more of how to do it. Right. But he's still doing the same thing the young doctor does. He just maybe has a more mature way of doing it. Yes. <laughs> so I think a good example of the term when people doctors There you go. Except, <laughs> except that would be a HIPAA violation. <laughs> yes. Sure. Right. 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 And remember that the purpose for the law, the purpose for all of God's laws is what? What's, what's the goal of our instruction? First Timothy chapter one. <laughs> I didn't give them to you. God did. <laughs> First Timothy one three. If you don't know the goal of the law, we're uh, the, the, our, the goal of God. We're going to find it here. Verse three says, "As I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation." rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Now, he says, Timothy, your job is to, go to, is to go to Ephesus and teach them to quit following dumb ideas. Why? Well, look at, look at verse 5. But the goal of our instruction is love. When I was growing up, and on the 4th of July, we had a ton of, we had a ton of cousins. And on the 4th of July... I guarantee you somebody was going to pop a firecracker in their fingers. And my grandmother, who loved us, would stick our fingers in butter. Anybody remember that? Now, everybody today knows, no, you don't stick those fingers that are hot and burning in butter because it makes the heat stay in there. You put them under running or cold water. That's what you do with the fingers now. Now, she was listening to an old wives tale. She listened to a myth. Now, she was trying to do what was right, but the fact is it didn't result in me getting the attention I need when I blew my fingers up, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I take the fifth on that. But, but, but the, point, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is this. The reason that we don't want to follow error is not so God can say, oh, look at how right they are. The reason we don't want to follow error is because error is going to get us to treat people different than what they're supposed to be treated. And Jesus came down to show us how to love one another and how to treat one another. And some people think that's wishy-washy and it's or mushy. It's not. Love is very is very tough and love is firm. Love does what other people wouldn't do. Love will jump in a uh, to save somebody, even in, for example, in, in the ocean, even when that person thinks they might not have the, the strength to do it, love is going to cause them to jump in there in order to do that. It's not something wishy-washy and mushy. Love stays with their mate when their mate gets senile or becomes crippled. Love stays with them. So what I'm trying to tell you and what, I, what I'm trying to get us to understand is the law was designed to be a tutor. It was to take us somewhere. And we're supposed to take us is to Jesus. And the Bible says God is love. 
So what's it supposed to take us to? Love. But how am I going to know love? By knowing Jesus. If I don't know Jesus, I don't know love. And so I, I got to know, I got to know Jesus. And so the law was designed to bring us to maturity, not just getting old, but was trying to teach us how to love people. That's why the Bible says, if you love your neighbor, what have you done? You have fulfilled the law. If you love your neighbor, you'll fulfill the law. God doesn't want us going around with a book of laws when we, when we go to the grocery store. Okay, and somebody says something, okay, what law do I do? Right. No, God says, I've been tutoring you for, for a century. I've been tutoring you in what you're supposed to do. It should become natural. By the way, that's what Ephesians chapter 5 is talking, or 4 is talking about when he says that we need to renew our minds with the inner man. It needs to become something that we don't even think about anymore. We don't cuss at somebody when they cut us off. We don't have to think, oh, I better not say that because Jesus will condemn me if I do. No, we shouldn't even have to think that because we have the spirit of Jesus in us. He's taught us. Yes. Right. 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 That's what the law does. Right. The, the, the law was the tutor. Okay. Now, back to First Timothy one five. It says, "But the goal of our instruction is love." Well, where does that love come from? Well, it has to come from a pure heart, and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So do I have to have faith in order to love properly? Yes. What, what if I have faith in Buddha? Is it going to cause me to act different towards other people than what Jesus would want me to act? Yes, it is. It's, it's, going, to it's going to cause me to act different. Okay. It, it, if I follow some, some psychiatrist's idea of how I'm supposed to treat people, I will act differently towards other people than what Jesus wants me to, to do. And until I understand Jesus, I'm never going to act the way I'm supposed to act. And that's what the Jews didn't like. The Jews wanted somebody who was going to come in and destroy their enemies. How many movies do you watch on television that have to do with revenge? Or cheating? Or people lying? Or people stealing? Right? Because that's what Jesus wants us to do. No. Then why do we like watching those? There you go. That's right. We like watching other people do it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I'm sorry. Did I miss somebody? Leroy. Right. That's right. Right. So, so remember that little statement that somebody once said, I don't know who said it, but they said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So how much does Jesus care for us? He died on the cross. So maybe we ought to listen to him. Maybe we ought to listen to him. See, that's what the devil was doing. That's what Satan was doing in the Garden of Eden. Satan was telling Adam and Eve, God doesn't care about you. God doesn't care about you. So this whole experience here is God teaching us that he cares about us. He spent time with us. He should have destroyed us with Noah in the flood, but he didn't. He allowed us still to exist. He could have just wiped himself off and said, I'm sick of these people. But he made a covenant. He made a promise over here to Adam and Eve, and he had to keep it because he's true to himself. And this whole story is a story about God saying, I love you, and we still didn't get it. So God says, I'm going to send my son down there, and him they will. Remember the parable? And him they will respect but what they do with him they killed him what do we do with him no what do we do with him as, as believers as we respect him we respect the son we say we want to be like the son so we're not going to retaliate we're, we're we're not going to um um hurt people we're not going to cheat people we're not going to take advantage of people we're, we're not going to treat people different because they're taller or shorter or fatter or skinnier or prettier or or, or whatever uh we you know we might treat them different if they make good tacos but that's different uh 
but the, the point I'm trying to make is that, that when he talks about being a tutor, he's trying to take us somewhere. Yeah. So when you just think about this for, for one minute, if you think the idea is you have the Old Testament law, and then he comes along and gives us another set of laws, then what didn't the tutor do? The tutor didn't teach us anything. Because if I need another tutor to teach me the same thing, then that was a terrible tutor I had. Or maybe it's just my idea of what the tutor is supposed to do. So the Old Testament wasn't to bring us to another law. It was to bring us to maturity. And by the way, that's what chapter four is going to start talking about. Chapter four is going to talk about the relationship between parents and children, which God starts actually right here with this verse. Yes, Brother Leroy. Yeah. Right. That's right. That's right. And, and not just dig, your, dig yourself into the book, but find out why the author is writing what the author is writing. Why, why did God write it this way? Why didn't God write it a different way? N not just, I'm going to examine what the words are. It's why, why did the Spirit of God make God write this like this? And that's why when, when, whenever you study, you need to ask for God's Spirit. Because if you don't have God's Spirit, if you have the world's Spirit when you interpret something, you're going to come out with, we're under law to be saved, so therefore I have to keep all the laws, because that's the way the world is. That's not God's Spirit. Uh, over there first and over here. And if we don't cover anything, it's you guys' fault. Okay, go ahead. Right. Right. That's right. And that's why Jesus said to the Jews, if you believed in Moses, you believed in God, why are you trying to kill me? Katie. Well, the fact that you know you're going away indicates that the spirit is working in your life. If you didn't, if you didn't sense yourself going away, then you wouldn't have God's spirit because it wouldn't bother you. Why do you go away? Well, because we still have the pulls of the flesh. We're, we're, we're... <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. That's a lot of thinking. <laughs> right. Now the pro the problem with that. Oh, Ben, go ahead. Ben's going to help us here. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. I think what you said is it's not a sin to be tempted. Right. And when Satan comes and he puts thoughts in our brain or whatever, that's temptation. Right. right. Then what do we do with that? Right. Right. And sometimes in our weakness, we fall in sin. Right. right. We, but like I like said, because we realize, oops, we do, then we want to get right with God again. Right. Exactly. And if you didn't have the spirit, that wouldn't bother you. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it's another word for it, but yes, sure. That's why, the, that's why the Bible says Jesus saw them and had compassion for them. Compassion is, is the result of love. If you love somebody, you'll feel compassion for them. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> yes. Okay. It's Ben's fault. He said, <laughs> he said, if Satan puts something in the mind, here we go again with Satan. Yep. Where is that coming from? And what does Satan look like? And why is he putting it in my mind? Because Good question. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, why all of a sudden would this thought come into my head? Satan. It's. Where is he coming from? Uh, I don't know exactly where it's coming. It might be something you saw. It might be something that triggered something that's in our that we've seen before in our minds that get us to think of those things. 
you know, I, we, we, we're not all sure how the psyche works. Right, yes. Satan knows we belong to God. Yeah. Those of us who are trying to walk in that light, Satan wants you back. Yes. Sure. So, and let's face it, like something you once said, if sin wasn't fun, there wouldn't be so much of it. Okay. Yes. 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 Sure. Yes. Sure. Right. Right. All right. Want to try to cover more than one verse? <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's only fun if you think it's fun. Right. It's only fun if you think it's fun. It's an example that you can see perfectly. There, are, there is human trafficking, human sexual trafficking. The guys that go into those women are having fun. It's not fun. The only reason they're, they're having fun is because they decided that they like it. They think it's fun. That's, that's, why James, that's why James says we're supposed to turn our laughter into mourning and our mourning into joy. The things that we were sad about, like, I was a virgin and I don't want anybody to know. No, you should be happy you're a virgin. You should be happy when you're a virgin, not I got to cover it up because people are going to think I'm, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm not sophisticated or whatever. So, so when we talk about fun, it's not that fun is inherent in the activity. Fun is what I choose to think about it, which is why you have fun watching the Dodgers. Okay. No, I... <laughs> No, I, I didn't say it was sinful unless you're a Giants fan. Okay. I, I said you enjoy watching the Dodgers. Somebody else enjoys watching the Olympics. Okay. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. But the point is, fun is not inherent in the activity. Fun is in how I view the activity. And that's why God says, if you're one of his children, you're going to change the inner man so that the way you respond to activities is going to be according to his will and not according to our will. Okay. Right. But but to answer your question also, one of the reasons why people think sin is fun is because the world promotes it as fun. The world tells you it's fun. The world says you're supposed to have fun. The world says you're crazy if you don't have fun doing it. You you, you deserve it. Yes, but in that activity, in that sinful activity. Okay. Yes. You've been so patient. I always think when you're sin about. I always think Satan wants to make fools of us. Right. He wants us to look our works. Right. And when we wallow into the sin and don't think we we are sinning, because he will trick us. Right. And make us think wrong is right. Right. So yeah, we have that battle, and we have to remember Satan just wants me to look at my works. Right. And he. And my Lord wants me to look my best. Right. And. To bring out my best. Right. And when and when Satan makes you look bad, he wants you to feel bad. Yeah. And he wants you to feel so bad that you say to yourself, God can't save me. God doesn't want me. Nobody loves me. I deserve to die. And some people do. And some people die spiritually. Right. Just so you know, I'm trying to cover more than one verse today. Okay. So verse 25 of Galatians 3 says, but now that faith come, we are no longer under tutor. So the law is designed not to take us to another law, but it's to take us what a tutor does. And what is that a tutor does? Verse 26, for you are, uh, 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 but now that faith has come, we're no longer under tutor. For you are all sons of God. Now, he uses the word sons of God here. And this word sons is not... Can you read this? No. Um, it's too light. The old chalkboard would be better. Son, the light. word sons is not equal to, there might be another argument, toddlers. There's a D in it. I, I, there is a D. Another D? <laughs> there you go. Okay. The word sons here is not toddlers. Right. What's a toddler? So it's a baby. It's somebody. You, it's somebody you have to watch all the time. Oh, it's somebody who needs a tutor. 
You don't leave a toddler by themselves very long, do you? Why not? Because they're going to get, they might get hurt. They might hurt somebody else. They might get in trouble. They don't know, they don't know the danger that, well, the law was designed not to bring us to another law, but was designed to make us sons. And this word sons in the Greek is, is the word weos, which means a son of age to inherit. <laughs> it's Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. 26. He says, For you are all sons. The four is the reason. The reason that the, the, the law is our tutor is to bring us to Christ so that you can be sons. Now, this son is not toddlers, this son is mature sons. So when you have a mature son, do you watch every single thing he does? Oh, no. no. Now, you might think he does some things that aren't very wise, like going down a mountain with, on a bike, but, or jumping out of an airplane, you know, skydiving, but he's mature enough to make his own decisions. Or rides a motorcycle. Or rides a motorcycle. That's the, that's the purpose for the law. The law was to bring us to be mature sons. It wasn't, I'm going to give you another set of laws. Mature people don't need laws. Not really. Okay? My wife and I don't have a set of laws on our wall that tell us how to treat one another. The law of Jesus is supposed to be on our hearts. Now, does that mean that, that we treat each other properly all the time? No, but we also ask each other's forgiveness. Yes. There you go. That's right. That's right. But, but what I want to understand, that's what the law is designed to do. The law is designed to bring us to be sons. God doesn't want robots. God wants sons. God wants children. Do you want, well, uh, I have an aunt. Her, her, her name is Aunt Yola. And she has a son. His name is Mikey. And Mikey is a special needs child. And he can't do anything without her. Now, even though she loves him, and even though she wants to protect him and take care of him, do you think that every once in a while she'd like to be able to just leave him alone and her be able to do what she needs to do? Of course. Of course. Because that's what's supposed to happen. Well, that's God with us. God wants us to be sons that he can put on a world, and he knows we're going to take care of it. He knows we're going to love one another. He knows we're going to do good for one another. That, that's what he wants us to do. Now, that, does that mean God's going to be out of our picture? Out of, no, it's not. But the point is, that's what law is designed to do, is to bring us to be sons. And you and I are supposed to be sons and daughters of God. But a lot of times we act like just religious people <clears throat> instead of sons and daughters of God. And so he's trying to bring us to be sons. That's what he's trying to bring us. And that's why the rest of this section, this section, the next one, changes from law to being children. Right. But, but children isn't even a good word because it's not the word for, we think of children as babies. It's the, it's the word weos, which means, but babies can be children. Okay, this word, babies cannot be sons. Right. Toddlers cannot be sons in this verse. Right. This verse, sons, means sons of age or maturity. It's, right. it's the word weos, right. which is what God is trying to bring us to. It's, that's the reason why at the end of this section, he says in verse 29, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. Yeah. Well, who, who, who gets to inherit the promise? Mature sons. That's who inherit the promise. The problem, promise is mature sons. He's trying to bring us to maturity so we can inherit. That, that's, who he's, that's what he's going to do. But the point I'm trying to make right now is that the law wasn't given us to be a tutor to bring us to another law. You understand that? Yeah. It's not Old Testament law, New Testament law, Old Testament law bad, New Testament law good. Right. It's the purpose for any law. Any law designed to bring us to maturity. You know, I, I kind of giggle at Albert. I've been trying to teach him how to drive. And he's, <laughs> taken, he's taken his test three times. 
and he hasn't passed. I didn't teach him how to drive right away. He needs a better, he needs a better tutor. He, he needs more time driving, but, but three times, right? Now, you and I could go and take the test and we'd pass just like that. Well, well, <laughs> well, the rest of us could, Elaine, okay? The rest of us could pass just like that. Well, well why? Because the law's in our heart. We don't have to think about it. We, we, we don't have to say, oh, I got to stop, you know, in, in front of the crosswalk. Uh, I need to make sure if I have enough time before I go, the light's yellow, am I going to make it or not? We don't even think about that stuff. We just do it. That's the way God's law is supposed to be written in our hearts. And the law is designed to do that, to bring us to maturity, because God wants mature children over here first and over there. I would say that's in, in our schools. We start, we don't go into first grade and they teach us algebra. Right. We have to start every year. It leads you up to grade 12 so you graduate or go to college. Right. It's a process. Right. And, and you don't go to college to go to college forever. Right. Do you? Well, some do. Some do. <laughs> but, but no. We, we go to college to learn something, and then we practice what we learn. Well, God's trying to bring us to be his children. That's why he says... Verse 25, now that faith has come, you're no longer under a tutor. For, here's the reason why. For, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We've all become God's sons, weoses. Okay? Now, verse 27. For, how, how do we know that happened? For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So he says, one of the things that we did to indicate that we wanted to get into God's spiritual kingdom, one of the activities we did to prove we believed in him was what? Well, we were baptized. We were baptized. Why were we baptized? So we could get into Jesus. Now, don't think of getting into Jesus. I got baptized, so therefore I'm in Jesus. Well, we're, we're in God's family, but now we got to get Jesus in us is what we have to do. Right, we have to clothe ourselves with Christ. And, and so when he says, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that if you, if you were baptized, then you were smart enough to know that you needed Jesus by faith, and you were smart enough to know that if you trusted him and he told you to be baptized, then that's what you're going to do. And we understand that... There's nothing in the water. It, it, it's, it's, not some, it's not some physical law that if you get dunked in water, your sins are going to be removed. It's a spiritual reality. We get dunked in, in water because God said for us to do that. We trust him. And he's going to operate on us in that, in that condition, just like the doctor is going to operate on you. If you have something wrong with your, with your internals and you took an x-ray and the x-ray showed you the the, the problems you had, then you're going to go to a doctor and the doctor's going to do whatever he needs to do, but you have to get up on the table. If you don't get up on the table, he's not going to be able to do what, what uh, he needs to do. Now, if you take that to Colossians 2 and verse 9, Colossians 2 and verse 9, he says, for in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you, uh, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the, removal of, uh, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So he says, we were spiritually circumcised in Christ. Well, when did that happen? He says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. So when you get up from the operating table, you had faith in something. What do you have faith in? You had the faith in the doctor who put you to sleep. Now, somebody says, but baptism is a work, not for me. I'm not the one working. I'm dead. Who do we bury? Who, who do we bury? We bury dead people. We don't bury live people unless you don't like them. We, we, don't, we, we, don't bury, we, we don't bury live people, bury dead people. So it's not a work I'm doing. I'm not doing the work. 
the doctor's doing the work. And the guy who's baptizing me is, is representing, you know, if you want to put it this way, representing God, putting me down on the table and operating on me and then picking me back up. And, and I didn't do the work. I let him do it to me. So a lot of times people say, well, baptism is a work. Well, no, baptism is a response of the heart for a good conscience. That's what baptism is. We're, we're doing it because we're trusting that Jesus is going to cut out sin in our life when that happens. Now, I believe that. I don't want you to think I don't believe that. I do. I, I believe that, that, that people should be baptized in Jesus. Now, but here's what I want us to understand. Just because you're baptized doesn't necessarily mean you put on Jesus. Amen. It might simply mean that you did what your church or your community of believers right. said you had to do so that you could earn salvation or be accepted into their group okay and what what jesus what paul is pointing out over here is that the when the law brings us to maturity in christ and it it, it then makes us sons and sons want to do what their father tells them to do and so he says for you're all sons and uh, uh for you all sons of god by, through faith in Christ Jesus, verse 27, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, were you baptized just to get into a group? You were, why were you baptized? Yes. Oh, and you want to follow him. See, we got baptized because we wanted to clothe ourselves with Jesus. Not just I'm trying to get into a group. Not just I'm trying to get into a church that says they're the kingdom. So once I'm in their group, then I'm in the kingdom of God. See, that's where, that's where we messed up. Yes. Right. Exactly. Now, uh, uh, he, he does say... For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You remember way back over here in the Garden of Eden? Remember way back over there? Adam and Eve sin. God said, I'm going to make a, a, a seed. It's going to come from Eve. That's going to bruise that of Satan. Remember all that? And then, G, and then God cast them out. But he did something before he cast them out. Didn't they already have clothes? They had fig leaves. They sewed fig leaves together. Oh, he killed an animal. He killed something that was alive in order to get their skin so that he could clothe those people so they would understand that for God to have any kind of relationship with them, they have to be clothed with something that died. Well, there's that shadow. There's that shadow over here. People read that and they kind of go, why? Yes, God didn't like animals. Old Testament, God's always killing animals. Guess, guess he's not part of PETA. No. The point is, he's trying to get his people to understand that it's going to require somebody to die for them and for them to trust in that person for God to be able to have a relationship with them. And why is that? And it's because unless you understand that God loves you, you're going to approach everything he does through legal systems. Well, not just spiritually, and yes, you do. But you have to understand God loves you. He, he wants, he's had, trying to have a relationship with you. It's not you keep all the rules right, you get to stay in the house. You don't keep all the rules right, you get kicked out. Yeah. What? Because he first loved us. And from the very beginning, he was telling us, I'm going to prove to you that I love you. Because I'm going to be this person that comes from the woman. I want to be this person that comes into the world and dies for you. And I'm going to defeat your enemy so that you can know I love you, so that you'll be willing to be under my rule.
but we have to grow up. We have to grow up. And we have, we have to understand that that's why Jesus came. And that's why he then starts to treat us and talk, talk about us in relationship as sons. Because that's what the law was designed to do, to bring us to be sons and daughters of God. And the problem with the world out there is they think they're sons and daughters of black people. And they're sons and daughters of Mexicans. And they're sons and daughters of white people. And they're sons and daughters of the elite. And they're sons and daughters of the politicians. And they're, they're sons and daughters of everybody except for God. And we're sons and daughters of God. That's right. That's right. And that's why we love everybody. You come here, we love you. Might not be the easiest person to get along with, but we love you. You might not agree on everything, but we're going to love you. There you go. Because once we understand that God loves us and I'm a sinner just like you, we're all in the same boat. We're all exactly in the same place. I need as much grace as you do. Then I'm not going to be looking down to you, nor am I going to be looking up to you. And that's going to make us on the same level field that God made Eve for Adam. God made Eve for Adam to be a like him, suitable for him. God made all of you guys suitable for me and me suitable for you. And if you're in Christ Jesus, we're suitable for each other. The only time I'm not suitable is when I get outside of Jesus. And so he's talking to them about sons. And so he says, for, your, for you were all baptized for all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. He says, your identity is wrapped up now in Jesus. Your identity is not wrapped up in whether you're white or black or whether you're Republican or Democrat. Your identity is wrapped up in the fact that you are one in Christ Jesus. We're one in him. Even male and female, we're one in him. Now, I got some things to say about that, but I don't have time to say them today. I'll say them next week. But the point I'm trying to make now is when we all become sons, and if we're all sons, which of your sons is more important than the other? It doesn't work like that, does it? Now, I might have one that's smarter. I might have one that's healthier. I might have one, you know, that's a little different. But they're one. They're all one. And which one do I love more? I love them all the same. At least I'm supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So when he says there's neither a Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, that's where our identity is. All right, anybody have any other questions I'm afraid to ask? Yes, Ben. <laughs> in answer to the previous question earlier okay. in class okay. about new moon. Okay. okay. Numbers 28 starting in verse 11, speaks about the new moon and the feast. Thank you, Ben. That was Numbers 28? Yes. Thank you. What? Starting with verse, verse 1, 11. or verse 11, sorry, yes. Yes, Pumpkin. Uh, could you clarify about Michael? Yeah. He doesn't have a slight complexion. He does have a complexion. Okay. He has slight blurriness. Okay. Okay. Good. But, yeah, but he, he does have an eye injury. Right. But it's hard to 
pulling, but uh, that's why seeing double vision as it was left off. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anything else before we leave? All right, let's have a prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're thankful that you wanted sons and daughters, and that you made us so that we could be your sons and your daughters. And therefore, we're special to you, not because of who we are, but because of who you made us and who you want us to be. We pray, Father, that you help us to remember that you gave us laws for the purpose of helping us to be sons so that we might be able to serve you, glorify you with our heart. We might have your spirit in us. We pray that you help us to be more like your sons and daughters. Pray that you help us to always clothe ourselves with your son, Jesus. We pray that you forgive us for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. And we are done. <laughs>